the secrets behind our deepest superstitions, merely old wives' tales, or more real than we could ever imagine. Don't walk under a ladder. Knock on wood for good luck. Never let a black cat cross your path. Ancient superstitions like these still resonate throughout our modern lives. I don't think there's any honest person who doesn't have some kind of superstition. But are these beliefs merely harmless rituals or risky deceptions that can actually cause serious harm? Being superstitious is one of the most dangerous things you can do because it takes you away from reality and into the world of fantasy and that can lead to your demise. We have the ability to control our world with the latest high technology, but who hasn't crossed their fingers, read their horoscope, or touched something lucky before taking on a risky proposition? Where do these archaic rituals come from? And why do they have such a powerful hold over us, even today? Join us for Superstitions. The origin of superstitions dates back to the origins of human life itself. Primitive humans are at nature's mercy. They have no control over the weather, the geography, or the wild animals that threaten them. These natural elements are so powerful, they must be gods, gods that must be appeased. The earliest superstitions come out of this ignorance of all of the events around you. You don't know what causes thunder. You don't know why it rains and other times there are droughts. So to make things favorable for yourself, you dream up a rain dance to make it rain. You pray to a fertility goddess that you have lots of children. We are pattern-seeking storytelling animals and what we do is we try to understand the world around us. The problem is, is that uh, in evolution, we did not develop a screening mechanism that avoids all false connections. So we occasionally connect A to B when they're not really connected, and that's called superstition. Perhaps the first superstitious connection seeks to solve the mystery we still struggle to understand today, the mystery of our own deaths. The first superstitious belief that we know about is with Neanderthal people some 50, 60,000 years ago. When they buried their dead, and they were the first people to actually bury the dead and not just walk away from a deceased relative, they put them in the ground with tools, with food, with flowers, with the belief that there was an afterlife and they would need these things. We think that that was an indication of a type of superstition so probably religion, uh, or what, what looks like religion, uh, was the first form of superstition. The gods of these early religions are everywhere. They control everything. They give and they take away. The idea that gods inhabit stones or trees, or that there's a single god that inhabits the universe, uh, this, is, this is all a superstitious attempt to explain the big questions of the world. Where did we come from? Why are we here? Where are we going? As civilization develops, there are those who specialize in answering those questions. Fortune tellers seek visions of the future in a person's palm or in the entrails of animals. It's not quite fair to say that ancient peoples were superstitious. They had no other alternative way of knowing things, and therefore these were their beliefs and were their science of the day. Using their state-of-the-art instruments, ancient Assyrians and Babylonians not only chart the sky, they deify its heavenly bodies. Astrology is born. Over thousands of years, each culture creates its own ways to cope with the universal uncertainties of life. Remarkably, many disparate groups develop similar beliefs. Knock on wood goes back at least to the ancient Druids in the Celtic world, but also the uh, American Indians had a similar belief. And this is because ancient people often believed that their gods existed in trees. 
trees were high. They touched the heavens and the sky. They saw lightning strike the trees. They thought the gods were communicating up in the sky. And therefore, what would you do to a tree if you wanted to talk to your god and ask a favor? You go over, knock, knock. This is Charles. May I have some food tomorrow? I mean, so that's how the superstition evolved. As superstitions are passed from one generation to the next, they adapt and change with the times. Take the belief that it's unlucky to walk under a ladder. The roots of this superstition begin in ancient Egypt. Ironically, life in Egypt is spent preparing for the eternity of death. A tomb contains everything the departed will need, including one important object, the ladder necessary to climb up to the afterlife. The space underneath the ladder represents a holy trinity to the Egyptians, the god Osiris, his goddess Isis, and their son Horus. They believed that the triangle was a sacred symbol. Look at the shape of the pyramids. Again, triangles on the sides. And if you put a ladder against a wall, you get a triangle. And the belief was if you walked under a ladder, you violated the holy sacred space within the triangle. Thousands of years later, Christianity puts a new spin on the ladder superstition. To walk under the ladder would now mean disturbing the trinity of another holy family, Joseph, Mary, and Jesus. For the medieval soldiers who use ladders to attack their enemies, there's also a practical reason for the superstition, such as avoiding one of the enemy's favorite weapons, boiling oil. A few hundred years later, the superstition takes on yet another meaning. Ladders were also used in 16th century England to climb up to the gallows. So a person about to be hanged was walked under the ladder, and then he had to climb up the ladder to his own noose. So the ladder took on another bad luck symbol. And today, the superstition persists. Most of us feel walking under a ladder will bring us bad luck. People began to question irrational fears and superstitions as early as ancient Greece. One of these groups called themselves the skeptics. Well, skepticism actually has a long historical tradition. Again, it's just a way of, of asking questions about the world. And, and in Western history, this begins with the ancient Greeks, of course. 2,500 years ago, the philosopher Socrates put forth a revolutionary idea that became the foundation of all scientific inquiry. Socrates' most famous quote was, all I know is that I know nothing, whereas everybody else see, thinks they know something, and he realized, hey, you know, we, we actually don't know anything with absolute certainty. Unfortunately, most inhabitants of the ancient world prefer the unexamined life and the quick fix solution. The soothsayers who claim a direct pipeline to the gods provide superstitious rituals that give each citizen the illusion of control. One of these superstitions is still practiced today. If we spill common table salt, we feel compelled to perform a simple ritual to avoid bad luck. It started at least as far back as the Roman Empire where salt is worth its weight in gold. This most basic mineral is indispensable to life. It is used as a cleanser and antiseptic to preserve food and give it taste. Salt was so important that uh, our word for salary is from the Roman salaria, meaning salt money. And it was so prized that if you spilled it, it brought you bad luck. So when a Roman spills salt, it must mean an evil power threatens to take his precious supply. To appease the demon, he picks up a few grains of the spilt salt and tosses it over his shoulder where the fiend lurks. The ceremony, which must be done with the right hand over the left shoulder, comes from yet another superstition. The use of right and left often dictate the rituals of daily life. Romans, for example, always put their best foot forward. A footman at each door ensures that they enter on the right foot, and savvy Romans never get out of bed on the wrong side, that is, the left side. 
such superstitious beliefs evolve from the observation that most people are naturally right-handed. Therefore, those born left-handed are different, untrustworthy, perhaps even possessed by the devil. The Latin word for left, sinestre, will come to mean sinister in English. Discrimination and superstition against left-handed people will continue for more than 2,000 years. In 455 AD, the sack of Rome at the hands of the Vandals leaves the Western world in shambles. The growing power of the church forces secular learning and independent inquiry underground. I would say a lot of superstitions originated in the Middle Ages because they also were the dark ages. Life was brutal. People didn't have food, they didn't have heat, they didn't have shelter. Families of 10 people slept to one room. When conditions are that harsh, you turn to superstition to provide, let's all make this prayer tonight and maybe we'll have food tomorrow. You come up with all kinds of superstitious beliefs. In this fearful world, the only hope for a better life is in the next one. The church offers the promise of eternal salvation, but only if you follow its laws. During the Middle Ages, the church was actually one of the great debunkers of nonsense, but it was only the nonsense that they decided was nonsense, whereas their superstitions that they approved of were then uh, proffered to the people as acceptable. Some of the church's superstitions address the fear of rampant disease which threatens to engulf Europe. God bless you was really a superstition not to be sneezed at, I might add. It was really promoted by Pope Gregory the Great. There was a great plague in Italy. People observed that before they died, they would cough, they would sneeze. So Gregory said, there's this benediction, God bless you to be set over the sick to prevent them from actually losing their spirit and dying. The church takes old superstitions and alters them to fit their own agenda. To knock on wood no longer means to seek a favor from a tree spirit. The clergy transform it into a powerful reminder of the omnipotence of the church. To Christians in the Middle Ages, Wood was a sacred thing because Christ was crucified on the cross. So to knock on wood was a very good luck thing because you were actually asking a favor or good luck from Christ himself. During the Middle Ages, another ancient superstition adapts to Christian theology and a new invention. Today, if we break a mirror, we fear seven years bad luck. In the Dark Ages, it meant your very soul was in peril. For thousands of years, a person's reflection had been associated with their life force, their soul. A favorite place to find this soul was in a quiet pool of water. If the reflection broke up, it was a bad omen. It might mean an enemy had thrown a stone. By the 1300s, with the invention of the glass mirror, a person can see their soul anywhere they want and with amazing clarity. Now, when a mirror shatters, Christians theorize so too does the soul reflected within. Once again, there is also a practical reason behind the superstition. When they started using mirrors, mirrors were also expensive and rare. And to keep people out from breaking them, to keep servants actually from treating them carelessly, they told, if you break that, there's seven years of bad luck. But why the number seven? The top scientists of the day proclaim that it takes seven years for a human cell to renew itself. Only then will the shattered image of the old self be rendered harmless. The all-powerful medieval clergy rely on superstitions to reinforce the lessons of the Bible to their mostly illiterate flock. The faithful avoid Friday the 13th at all costs. After all, the ill-fated Last Supper included 13 guests, Jesus and his 12 disciples. And it was on a Friday that Jesus died on the cross. A Friday that Adam and Eve were expelled from the Garden of Eden. And a Friday that the Great Flood engulfed Noah and his ark. 
The church's most potent weapon of control is the threat of eternal damnation. Medieval peasants and lords alike are offered only one choice between Christ or Satan. Christianity fired the whole superstitious belief because they really zeroed in on the imagery of the devil, the imagery of hell. This opportunistic devil appears in many forms, none more insidious than the vampire. Although belief in vampires is widespread throughout Europe, it is particularly strong in 14th century Transylvania, where the unspeakably bloody massacres and tortures ascribed to the cruel prince Vlad the Impaler will later inspire Bram Stoker's novel, Dracula. The church once again comes to the rescue with a superstition. The cross will protect the faithful from vampires and other demons. Peasants also avail themselves of folk cures, such as garlic, to ward off the evil. Harmless old men and women sell many of these age-old folk cures. But the church wants exclusivity. To get rid of the competition, it labels the peasants' superstitions witchcraft and brands the vendors as witches. Witchcraft and related forms of, of superstitions were a way of not just explaining the world, but also blaming people. But typically, witches were marginalized people, women, older people, people that were on the margins of, of society. These old people frequently have pet cats. In ancient Egypt, the cat was considered sacred, but now there is guilt by association. Above all, a good Christian certainly does not want to run into a black cat, the cult black magic. It just might be a witch in disguise. In 1486, two Dominican friars publish an encyclopedia of demonology. In the next two centuries, the Malleus Maleficarum, the hammer of witches, will be used as justification to persecute hundreds of thousands of witches throughout Europe. In this orgy of torment and torture, there are those who will use the superstitious fear of witches to their own advantage. Another aspect of superstition that was quite nasty in the Middle Ages was personal revenge. If you don't like somebody, all you got to do is blame them for witchcraft, accuse them of witchcraft. And if you can get a trial and you can get them accused and, and, and found guilty, you might end up with their cow, their farm, their house, their money their wife or husband. By the 17th century, those on the cutting edge of science and philosophy begin to take advantage of a new freedom of thought. Many superstitions are unmasked as ignorant and irrational beliefs. In the 17th century, there was an interesting change that took place. There was this sense that through reason and understanding and through science, we could begin to understand our world and have greater control over it. But it's not always as simple as it seems. The English scientist, Dr. William Harvey, demonstrates how blood circulates throughout our bodies, but he has no idea how to prevent a heart attack. Our fears still provide a fertile ground in which new superstitions flourish. Average life expectancy was about 30 years, and King Charles II would often have special ceremonies in which he would touch people and it was believed that he would heal them. Uh, in one year, he touched as many as 8,000 people and they would also put a gold coin on a ribbon around people's necks and the coin itself was thought to be a healing talisman and people were told not to take it off or else their disease would come back. As time passes, New advances in science and technology finally promise to liberate us from the uncertainties of life. Yet those with a dangerous occupation still need good luck. Sailors, for example, create a complex system of beliefs to keep them safe from harm. They forbid whistling at sea. A whistling wind might answer with a storm. Many choose to wear earrings, 
a pierced ear releases harmful spirits from the body that attract evil. They sport a tattoo of a cross to ensure a Christian burial. And sailors don't allow women on board. The female sex is considered so ignorant, they just might whistle up a storm. Yet if the departing sailor tastes the salt of his loved one's tears, he knows she will be faithful until his safe return. The superstitious have never underestimated the power of love and sex. In the 20th century, there is one fearless explorer who charts new erotic ground deep within the human mind. In 1917, Sigmund Freud publishes The Origin of Psychoanalysis. But has he discovered on his couch a revolutionary understanding of the subconscious or a collection of new superstitions? It's possible to look at much of Freud and certainly a great deal of Jung in the idea of symbolism in terms of superstition. I mean, is a necktie really a symbolic representation of the phallus of the penis? I mean, it's possible cultures in the future will look back and say, boy, were they superstitious. They took every ordinary object and imbued it with some kind of sexual good luck or bad luck. Sometimes, as Freud reportedly said, even a cigar is just a cigar. But what about an onion or an asparagus? From time immemorial, superstitions have touted the erotic power of certain foods. We know the onion makes us cry, but in the ancient world, it was believed to make sparks fly. Onions were thought to be such a potent aphrodisiac that celibate Egyptian priests were afraid to let an onion touch their lips. And in the Arab world, they were thought to perform the same function as Viagra. As for asparagus, the exhausted lover took them to revive. But the stalk must be firm and eaten with one's fingers. Spicy peppers were always good, if only for their phallic shape. It's said that Cajun men sprinkled dance floors with ground pepper, hoping the women would inhale it as they danced. And the unlikely prune was given to men who visited Elizabethan brothels as a stimulant. Chocolate, the sacred drink of the Aztec goddess of fertility, is now given to a modern goddess as a token of love. Indeed, science has recently proved that chocolate actually contains the pleasure-inducing endorphin phenethylamine, although in reality, a serving of salami carries a hundred times more of the chemical than an entire chocolate bar. The 21st century. The way we meet our future mates may have changed, but making a good match is as tricky as ever. There are a lot of superstitions around weddings because marriage is so difficult. It's so hard for two peoples to stay together that they've made up lots of good luck symbolism to keep you together. The modern bride and groom might not realize it, but a wedding ceremony follows age-old superstitions. The bridal veil is an ancient disguise so that evil spirits won't recognize her. Bridesmaids and grooms are another subterfuge. In ancient Rome, 10 witnesses prevented the demons from targeting the couple for bad luck. Obeying the rhyme from Victorian England, the bride wears something old to bring good luck from the past, something new in hope for the future, and something borrowed to carry the luck of a well-wisher. The something blue custom actually began in ancient Israel. Blue, the color of the sky, is the color of loyalty and constancy. As the most powerful symbol of marriage, the wedding ring is the focus of numerous superstitions. There's not a consensus of opinion on what the wedding ring really means. Some people in Christianity say it's a circle because it means never broken love. Others say it actually goes back to and has a much more sinister origin. It goes back to the time when you would actually steal your bride from a neighboring tribe and you would carry her over the threshold by force and therefore that custom and you would chain her to the house. You would tether her to the house with a rope so she didn't get away. And the ring became a symbolic representation of the tether that once held the bride to the house. I prefer that one. 
Whatever the reason for wearing one, the ring must go on the fourth finger of the left hand. Why? The ancient Egyptians believed that a vein in that finger runs directly to the heart. The other thing, too, is marriage is supposed to produce a lot of children. So a lot of the superstitions have to do with fertility, such as um, throwing rice. It was a symbol of abundance. People eventually, uh, initially threw wheat and grain to show here is an abundance. We wish for you to have an abundance of children of good luck. They then baked the wheat into little cakes, and they would at sometimes throw the actual cakes during Roman times. Eventually, they had these huge multi-tiered wedding cakes, which you did not want thrown at you, but symbolically, you ate the cake instead to get the equivalent of the good luck. In olden times, the newlyweds drank honey and wine for a moon cycle to guarantee fertility. If today's honeymoon does not have the same purpose, it could still end up with the same result. What's never guaranteed is the outcome of a sports competition. Even the most skilled athlete sometimes needs a little help. Call it magic, call it mojo, or call it superstition. Perhaps professional athletes are some of the most superstitious people that we see in everyday life. So why is this? Athletes are superstitious because, first of all, there's a lot hinging on their play or their performance. They're making a lot of money. Uh, they want very much to win, to win the World Series or win the Super Bowl. And yet they can't control the outcome entirely. Baseball players are some of the most superstitious of any athlete. Babe Ruth always touched first base on his way into the dugout from right field. Jackie Robinson had to walk in front of the catcher to reach the batter's box. Joe DiMaggio insisted on touching first base when he crossed the field. Wade Boggs, the former New York Yankees third baseman, was perhaps one of the most superstitious people on the planet. Uh, he used to believe that eating chicken brought him hits. And so for 20 years, he's eaten chicken before every single baseball game. Many athletes have lucky clothes and favorite personal rituals. Wayne Gretzky, when he played, always used to tuck the right side of his jersey underneath his hip pads. Michael Jordan always wore North Carolina shorts underneath his Chicago Bull shorts because he played for North Carolina as a college player. The tennis star Bjorn Borg used to stop shaving when he went to Wimbledon. It apparently was a good luck charm for him. Chicken dinners, old uniforms, facial hair. None of these superstitious rituals can be connected to an athlete's skill and performance. Or can they? They can have an important psychological effect. If you have the expectation that your charm or your lucky shirt is going to bring you some good thing, then it can, in fact, uh, be sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy and can make you feel better and perform better. Although some gamblers might like to think it involves skill, most games of chance are exactly that. It's well known that the odds are always in the house's favor. But that doesn't stop the gambler from betting again. And again. And again. Gamblers are another subculture that is particularly superstitious, and it's quite understandable why. They are playing a game, or many games, that are essentially random. Uh, there, there's no way that you can control the roulette wheel in many cases, uh, card play is completely random. And so gamblers are in great need of ways of providing a sense of control. Gamblers don't care where the magic comes from. They just hope it works. Cross fingers have different beliefs in different cultures. We inherited the belief that you cross your finger as a good luck sign to trap in luck between the joints of the fingers. In other words, if I'm on a good luck roll, I say, boy, I hope this continues, and I lock in the luck between the fingers. Today's gambler draws comfort from the talismans of centuries past. 
The rabbit's book predates Christianity. People observed bunnies have lots of little bunnies, and therefore if you own some part of the rabbit, it didn't have to be the foot. It could it sometimes be the ear, any part of the rabbit, you would have lots of children. It eventually evolved to the foot, and Freud said because the foot has always been a phallic symbol. So if you want fertility, what better thing to have a phallic symbol? The horseshoe, the legend goes back to St. Dunstan in the 10th century. He, as legend has it, was visited one day by this stranger who wanted to have new hooves put on, and Dunstan picked up the foot and said, a cloven hoot, this must be Satan. The blacksmith drove the nails into Satan's feet with such force that he howled in pain, promising never again to enter a house with horseshoes over the door. When you're waiting for it to come up, every number has its own potent magic. There are some numbers that carry centuries of good fortune, such as three, the Trinity. Seven is also a favorite. The Bible tells us it took seven days to create the earth. But the ancients also noted seven heavenly bodies in the sky, seven seas, and seven wonders of the world. The most powerful numbers are those that carry a special significance to the gambler. A social security number, a birthday, an address, a number that appears in a dream. When lottery tickets were just handed to you and you did not choose your number, lotteries were not particularly popular in the United States. But when they, they began to allow you to choose your own number, then they became much more popular. People began to play their daughter's birthdays or special numbers that seemed lucky to them. And this made it much more popular, gave people a sense that they might win, that they had some special control over the outcome. It is a typical office, nothing out of the ordinary, except that according to the ancient Chinese practice of feng shui, it has brought negative energy and bad luck to writer Kirsten Logatry. Kirsten didn't know what the problem was. She just didn't feel comfortable, and she couldn't write. She asked her husband to rearrange the furniture for her. My desk now was placed in the northeast corner of my office, and that that is the direction that governs intellectual ability, knowledge, scholarly efforts. Suddenly, I had focus, and I was in control of my materials. And I thought, you know, it seemed a little twilight zone to me at the time, but I thought, wow, that really makes sense. The ancient Chinese art of feng shui has become the hottest trend in home design today. Whether it is a potent force or a foolish belief, feng shui shares one characteristic with most superstitions. It, too, is deeply rooted in historical necessity. The practice began over 3,000 years ago, when farmers in southern China developed a system of beliefs based on their environment. They called it feng shui, the Chinese words for wind and water. If they planted their crops on the windward side of the hill, where the seeds and seedlings were unprotected, their crops didn't grow very well. So they began to think, well, let's see, where would nature like us to plant these crops? We'll plant them on the protected side of the hill. From that simple common sense observation, to this day comes the idea in feng shui that south is the most auspicious direction. This is the direction that brings us fame, fortune, and festivity. But can the practice of feng shui really change your life? Or is it just the recycling of an ancient superstition? History is filled with people who were superstitious. Napoleon was afraid of black cats. Socrates feared the evil eye. Julius Caesar dreaded dreams. Peter the Great was terrified of crossing over a bridge. Samuel Johnson, the writer, would only enter and exit a house with his right foot first. The superstitions are very, very common. It's not surprising that great people have had irrational beliefs. Power is often fleeting and following superstitions gives the illusion of control. 
Today, even as we've learned to master the world around us, why do superstitions stubbornly persist? We're a lot less superstitious than our medieval ancestors were. But considering that we live in the age of science and that we are now in the 21st century, it's hard to believe the number and percentages of people that believe in just utter silliness. The Gallup polls from 1990 show remarkable figures. For example, two-thirds of all Americans believe they've had some sort of psychic experience. Half believe in astrology and read their astrology columns. A third believe in witches and ghosts. And, and these figures are amazing. I, Ronald Reagan, do solemnly... Despite evidence to the contrary, Many people follow their astrological forecast as a sort of insurance policy, just in case it might be true. It's well known that Nancy Reagan used to consult an astrologer before agreeing to the president's schedule of travel. Actually, her explanation was quite good in the sense that uh, she was worried about her husband. Uh, there had been an attack on the pope. Anwar Sadat had been assassinated recently and there had been an attempt on President Reagan's life. So in a way, it's understandable that this is the way she would go in order to try to get more order and understanding of her world. The former first lady claimed her belief in astrology was fostered by her show business background. Another risky profession where superstitions abound. Superstition is not something that is restricted to unintelligent people or certain kinds of people. It seems to cut across all uh, economic and educational levels. Very smart and intelligent and hard-bitten people fall prey to superstitions. In 1991, a chain letter promising good fortune made its way through the highest levels of the publishing industry, including a sophisticated editor of the New York Times. Many people say that they don't really believe in superstitions, but they do them just in case. Uh, a person might say, this chain letter can't really bring me good luck, but I'm going to copy it and send it on anyway because what's the harm? I don't want to take a chance that something bad will happen. For most of us in our high-tech new millennium society, superstitions are a harmless way of life. Do I think that if you hang a crystal over your telephone, you will get all the telephone calls you hope for and none of the telephone calls you don't want to get? No. Are there things in feng shui that transcend logic, that transcend our ability to understand them? Yes. I'm a physicist by training, but I am very superstitious. I don't think there's any honest person who isn't, doesn't have some kind of superstition. And we are because there's so much randomness and uncertainty in daily life, and we reach toward superstition to give us some organization and pattern. I could drop dead during this interview, but I make a gesture that sort of brings me good luck or maybe forestalls the process. I believe that it's better to put your faith in science than in magic and reason rather than unreason. But it's interesting that even I can be affected by superstition. I think almost anyone can be. I was once flying on an airplane and encountering some turbulence and feeling some anxiety about that. A friend pointed out that I was sitting in the 13th row of the plane. And not only that, there was a full moon outside. And I noticed that for a second at least, I had a twinge of anxiety thinking about that. And then I realized, well, the whole plane is going to go down if it goes down, not just the 13th row. If we learn from history, we see where irrational fears can lead us to discrimination, persecution, and even death. On one level, it seems innocuous enough to read your astrology column or read something about feng shui and how you should orient your house. It doesn't seem that dangerous, but it is. 
I've asked the family members of the victims of Jonestown or of Heaven's Gate or of Waco if there's any harm to believing in superstitions, and the answer is, you're damn right there are. It's dangerous. The dictionary defines superstition as a belief held in spite of evidence to the contrary. The trick is knowing when it's innocent fun or a dangerous action. It's very critical that you ask certain questions about your own beliefs and ask yourself, how do you know what you think you know? How did you come to this belief? Did somebody just tell you to believe this? And, and more often than not, uh, you will find that you have been fooled. I have been fooled. We all have been because we all make mistakes in our thinking. For decades, a superstitious curse was rumored to be the cause of death of 11 people involved in the discovery of King Tut's tomb in 1922. Then, in 1999, a microbiologist found potentially life-threatening mold spores still alive on ancient mummies. Intriguing evidence that perhaps at least this age-old superstition has a scientific explanation.